this major. So where are you from originally? They just take a touch. It's Mandy Stein, which is very, very good to take a touch. Right. So we've got a good they go. Hello, I'm Simon Kirk and I'm a co-director of a company called Time Will Tell and we were approached by the Royal Astronomical Society about two years ago to produce a piece of work to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the first time that uh, women astronomers were admitted as fellows and associates of the society and so that's what we've done. We've produced a performance piece which is called The Way to the Stars. We hope you enjoy it. when they first gazed on the point of light in the night sky, when they noticed how the lights followed patterns, how they traced a path across the darkness, how after time the movements of these lights brought them back to where they had begun. Some of them were easier to understand. The brightest one, the sun, brought heat, light and life. The moon was a bit more tricky. It was a shapeshifter following a pattern of changing phases over a period of days. What if these objects passing across the sky day and night had a purpose? What if the movement of sun, moon and stars could be used to calculate time, to create a calendar? And if the heavenly bodies could do that, what else could they do? And so astronomy is born. So, what made a good astronomer? Well, let's start with the easy ones first. Good eyesight. Good eyesight. Oh, yes. Patience and ability to stay awake at night. Oh, a skill for making meticulous records of everything you saw. A talent for precise measurement and calculation. Yes, but there was something else the early astronomer needed. Oh, yes. Something that they would hold in common with all subsequent studiers of the stars. A high tolerance for the chilling torpor of routine. Ah, oh, yes, because apparently astronomy isn't all glamour. Mm. Apparently it's not all discovering never-before-seen stellar phenomena. Most of it is watching carefully a single point of light repeating or varying its track across the sky and then comparing it to previous observations and noting it down by hand. Again, and again, and again, and again. And, uh, <coughs> well, you get the point. Uh, so perhaps the most useful assets for an astronomer were a dedication to work. And a passion that never dies. Passion and dedication. The history of the science of astronomy is full of men who have exhibited both in abundance. <coughs> <coughs> Hippolytia of Athens was born in 370 AD. She was a perfect all-rounder in arts and sciences. She travelled to Athens to study mathematics and on her return lectured and wrote treatises to help her students and understand the more complex concept. Mm. She became a respected teacher. She also studied astronomy, creating an astrolabe and plane sphere. Mm. Uh, Mariam Alagia was born in the 10th century in Aleppo, Syria. Her father studied astrolabe construction under Bitolus, the most famous astrolabe maker of his day. In time, Mariam also became his student, and her handcrafted astrolabes were so intricate, accurate, and innovative that she was tasked to produce astrolabes for the ruler of Aleppo for 20 years. Oh. And Queen Seondioc of Sila, a kingdom of Korea, she was chosen to rule by her father because he had no sons. And she ruled for 14 years. And during her reign, she had the stargazing tower, or Taeyom Seon Day, constructed in her capital. Oh. The oldest observatory in the Far East. And it still stands today. No. <coughs> Uh, well, they say that behind every great man there's a, a great woman, certainly in the field of astronomy in the 16th and 17th centuries. That rings true. In Denmark, 
Tycho Brahe wrote of his admiration for his sister Sophia's determination mm -hmm. to study astronomy, despite him telling her not to. <laughs> she used her own money to have Latin texts translated and taught herself so that she could assist her brother in his observations of planetary orbits. That and in England, when the first astronomer royal, John Flamsteed, died, it was his widow, Margaret, who edited his collection of uh, star atlases and his catalogue of observations. But the brightest star of the time, straddling the 17th and 18th centuries, was a German astronomer, one of the most famous of her age. Maria Marguerite Kirsch. Maria was taught by her father and uncle, who be they believed she deserved an education equivalent to boys at that time. She was fascinated by astronomy from an early age, and as such, she needed to study it. She started as an apprentice and went on to become an assistant to the astronomer that she studied with. <coughs> and through him, she met Gottfried Kirsch, one of the most famous astronomers in Germany. They were married and they had four children. In 1702, Maria did something incredible. Her husband wrote an account of it. It was sort of like this. The scene. <clears throat> Early morning, March 21st. The sky is clear and starry. Maria is attending her regular nighttime observations. My dear. Oh, Gottfried, I think I have found something incredible. Uh, come quickly to my what, telescope. What, what have you seen? Oh, I think that I was looking, Gottfried, for that variable star you observed a few nights ago. Ah, yeah, when I looked last night, I could not see it. Well, I thought I would look for it, but I think I have found something else. Something <laughs> no one has observed before. Uh, what do you mean, my dear? I believe I have found a new comet. What? <laughs> What in Himmel? I think you are right. Oh, I shall write to the Academy. When my studies are published, I will be the first of my sex to give her name to a comet. Yes, this dear. This is a great day. Oh, yeah. Great day. Great day. Well done, you. <laughs> Unfortunately, it didn't quite work out like that. When this discovery was published, it was credited to Gottfried. It was suggested that if the truth were known, he would face professional ridicule. Mm. Or that Maria could not make a claim because she only published her findings in German, and Germany's only scientific journal was published in Latin. Mm. Although, to be fair, Gottfried did admit the truth. Mm. Eight years later, <laughs> and the comet was never given her name. Ah, but it didn't put Maria off. She continued her studies, and she wrote a seminal work on the conjunction of the Sun with Saturn and Venus. When Gottfried became ill, she carried out most of his work. And after he died, she continued his studies, and she petitioned to take his place. Well, it's not unusual for widows to take on their husband's business. She had the support of the president of the academy. But the academy's council refused to consider the possibility. The reason? It, it would set, set a precedent. precedent. Maria continued her work with a new patron. Offers of employment came in from across Europe. And Maria's son, Chris Fried, became the director of the observatory at the Berlin Royal Academy for Sciences. Maria and one of his sisters became his assistant. Until she was dismissed for refusing to stay in the background. <clears throat> After her death, her three daughters continued her work, supporting their brother as master astronomer. She was not alone in her field. There was Elizabeth Hevelius in Poland. Nicole René Lepote in France. Wang Chenyi of China. And as the 19th century dawned, the two women were to make their mark on British astronomy. And their achievements were recognised by a new society. <clears throat> if the 17th century saw a um, scientific revolution, yeah. and the 18th century saw a... Um, 
a dawning of um, uh, enlightenment, enlightenment yes. then the 19th century is the age of the society, the scientific society. Yes, yeah, yeah. Of course, we already had the Royal Society for um, Science. Yes, uh, science. We had the Royal Society for Art. Uh, yes. Ah, the, the Royal Academy. Mm. Uh, uh, the Linnean Society? Linnean. The Linnean Society was formed in 1788, bringing together the practitioners of natural history. Mm. The Royal Institute in 1799. No. 1804, the Horticultural Society. Ah, yes. 1805, the Royal Society for Medicine and the London Institution. 1807, the Geological Society. Oh, yes, yes. What these societies have in common was to bring together the leading lights in the field to make them acquainted with each other, stimulating their zeal, inducing them to adopt one nomenclature, facilitating the communication of new facts and ascertaining what is known in their science and what remains to be discovered. On January 12, 1820, at the Freemasons Tavern, Lincoln in Fields, a group of gentlemen met to... Take into consideration the advantages that are likely to result from the establishment of a society for the cultivation of astronomy. Yeah. We do hereby mutually agree to constitute ourselves a society to be called the Astronomical Society of London. Oh, yes. oh. Uh, a committee of eight gentlemen was formed to draw up the rules. Uh, they uh, set a general meeting to consider their regulations. Uh, recommendations for new members were suggested. And an address was prepared by Sir John Herschel as a statement of the new society's intentions and ambitions. <laughs> One of the first great steps towards an accurate knowledge of the construction of the heavens is an acquaintance with the individual objects there present. In other words, the formation of a complete catalogue of the stars and other bodies upon a scale infinitely more extensive than any yet undertaken and that shall comprehend the most minute objects visible in good astronomical telescopes. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> there were, of course, no women at this meeting. None were mentioned as potential members. And they weren't mentioned in the rules and regulations. Oh, this wasn't some willful decision made by a maverick movement of scientific misanthropes. In a world of rigidly enforced class structures where stasis equated to conforming to the rules and maintaining an unblemished reputation... What young lady of good birth and gentle breeding would wish to attend upon a meeting of strange scientific gentlemen without the company of her chaperone? Yes. Surely there were easier ways to find a husband. <laughs> Our female trailblazers were able to achieve their greatness, either because of the support from their families for their intellectual talents, their parents but the trend, and uh, their intellectual pursuits were encouraged, or they were born into wealth and therefore had a means to pay for their own instruction. But... As in astronomy, just when you think that you've seen everything that there is to see in the universe... A new phenomenon appears that breaks all the rules. Caroline Lucretia Herschel was one such phenomenon, as was Mary Fairfax Somerville. Neither of them had had the most promising starts in life. Both of them would go on to achieve greatness in astronomy. Caroline was struck with typhus, aged ten. It stunted her growth to four foot three inches. Her parents assumed she would never marry. Her mother wanted her to train as a servant. She learned sewing and dressmaking. In 1772, she left Germany to join her brother William, a music teacher in Bath. Mary Somerville was the daughter of a vice admiral. When she was 10, her father, describing her as a savage, sent her to a boarding school for a year. Mary received a basic education. Her uncle taught her Latin. She showed an aptitude for maths and she taught herself geometry. Around this time, her younger sister passed away. Her parents thought that learning contributed to her death. Mary was banned from further studies. This did not stop her. She continued her studies in secret. 
Caroline and Mary, their determination to pursue their interests was a common trait. Although they were very different personalities, Mary was a well-connected socialite, sweet, polite, and nicknamed the Rose of Jedburgh. <laughs> Caroline was devoted to her brother, William. Awkward in company, she didn't blend in well, and she made few friends. When William became interested in astronomy, <laughs> she became his assistant and collaborator, spending hours with him building and mounting telescopes and polishing mirrors. William would consult astronomical catalogues and then make observations. And Caroline would note them down, reduce them, and then organise them. It demanded speed, concentration, and accuracy. When William suggests that Caroline make her own observations, she dedicated herself to studying the night sky. <laughs> she had quite a knack for it, discovering eight new comets. But her outstanding contribution to astronomy was to compile a catalogue of stars with an index of all observations of John Flamsteed, with corrections, and 516 new stars. And when William died, Caroline continued her studies assisting his son, John Herschel, to produce a catalogue of 2,500 nebula. The very same John Herschel who wrote the first address of the Astronomical Society. Not only that, she was granted a salary by King George III, making her the first professional woman astronomer. Oh. Hey. <laughs> When, in 1828, the Astronomy Society awarded her the gold medal for her work, she was given the distinction of being the only female recipient for 168 years. In 1830, the Society received a further honour when King William IV consented to become its patron. And in 1831, with the granting of a royal charter, it became the Royal Astronomical Society. Oh, that same year, Mary Somerville uh, translated and published Laplace's The Mechanism of the Heavens to general acclaim. <laughs> in 1835, Caroline Herschel and Mary Somerville were both honoured by being made honorary members of the Royal Astronomical Society. Time marched on. <coughs> the 1850s marked the beginning of a golden age. More scientific societies were founded and social conventions changed. Some of these scientific societies enrolled women as members. The work of the RAS was expanding. Photography and spectrum analysis helped astronomers gain new insights. Improvements were made in the design and the construction of uh, reflecting telescopes. Uh, with the large scale of the British Empire, observations could be made across the world. Change was all around, including the field of women's education. Mm. The 1860s, women colleges were founded in America. Mariah Mitchell became professor of astronomy at Vassar College in New York State in 1865. She taught and inspired a succession of women academic astronomers. For British women, the establishment of female colleges in both Oxford and Cambridge was encouraging. Uh, but the syllabus was for classics rather than science. Yes, for a British woman with scientific interests, the new provincial astronomical societies offered better opportunities. Elizabeth Brown, amateur meteorologist and astronomer, encouraged and, and helped the female astronomers' cause. Oh, she travelled worldwide to view solar eclipses and to visit oh, solar institutions. Mm. And she was also <coughs> one of the women, of her, the only woman, I think, of her time, who had her own observatory. Oh. She was still an enthusiastic amateur. In the 1880s and the 1890s, at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich and across the Atlantic in the observatory at Harvard University, women were to be given an opportunity to prove themselves professionally. The decision to hire women as skilled workers to process astronomical data was both innovative and practical. If 
we were to put this mathematically, no, no. it would probably look something like this. Mm. If X right. is growing numbers of young lady mathematicians trained at university or college. And Y is the ever-growing amount of data generated by observations. And P is the lower wage paid to women. <laughs> then Y <clears throat> uh, divided by X over P equals the potential way of observatories on both sides of the Atlantic to recruit more people to process information. So, the directors of these observatories were going to give women a chance, but they were going to get their money's worth. study night and day to progress the hallowed halls of academe. Academe. And your skill at mathematics is the envy of your peers. And to be a paid astronomer's your dream. It's your dream. You want to show the world you have true talent. At, at physics, physics and photography your best. You're the best. But your efforts for advancement come to nothing. Because girls can't sit the civil service test. Service test. If you thought your toys were over, they have only just begun. A, a computer's life is not a happy one. Happy one. So it's off to the observatory to show them what you're worth and to set a fine example of your sex. Of your sex. Where it soon becomes apparent you are worth the lowest wage with a schedule that could leave you nervous wrecks. Nervous wrecks. You lose yourself in Herculean labours. To create the very latest stellar maps. Stellar maps. And you know you'll never get your findings published unless you share the credit with the chaps. With the chaps. And now, being good at calculus, it isn't always fun. A computer's life is not a happy one. Happy one. But nothing will deter you from the chosen path you tread. To prove yourself to all and leave your mark. Leave your mark. If you have a wish, it's that someone would volunteer an arm when you walk home unaccompanied in the dark. In the dark. Still, your confidence with instruments keeps growing. And you wonder if promotion may come soon. May come soon. But in your heart of hearts, a voice is growing. There's more chance you'll see the dark side of the moon, of the moon. And you wish you'd studied insects and not moon and stars and sun. A computer's life is not a happy one. Happy one. Lady computers would go on to fame. But in Britain, women astronomers still faced the same difficulties, getting official recognition, which was a prerequisite to getting professional recognition. And if they did get a foot on the ladder but then got married, they immediately lost their position. And of course, they could still not be elected as members of the RAS, which was the benchmark for professional astronomers. In 1890, the British Astronomical Association was formed to support the UK's amateur astronomers as a counterpart to the RAS. From the start, it admitted women members. Uh, the women on the council included uh, Margaret Huggins, Elizabeth Brown, um, Agnes Clark, Agnes Clark, and Agnes Gibbon. In 1891, Alice Everett and Annie Russell from Greenwich and Elizabeth Brown were put forward for election to membership of the RAS. Amongst those invited were two ladies who specialised in the field of spectroscopy. Mm. Yeah. Margaret Lindsay and Agnes Huggins. Mary Clark. Right, good. In 1903, in recognition of their outstanding contribution to this new field of astronomy, both ladies were elected as honorary members of the RAS. In 1906, the work of the ladies of the Harvard Observatory was similarly recognised. Wilhelmina Fielding for her work leading the Harvard computers, and Annie Jump Cannon 
for the creation of the new system of analysing stars. Oh, be a fine girl! Kiss me! Right now! Smack. <laughs> We're assuming that you all know what that means, because for us... <laughs> heralded in the white blouse revolution as women began to look for work outside of the of service of the factory and the home as the issue of female suffrage became prominent in the public imagination women astronomers kept working but now they were not just making notes from men's observations they were teaching students and lecturing at meetings, organising departments in astronomical societies, making their own observations and deductions, donating money to fund research and buy equipment, uh, submitting papers to scientific publications, and establishing prizes for original work, going on expeditions to look at um, astronomical phenomena. Then, in August of 1914, astronomers across Europe prepared themselves for the ordeal to come. The RAS and the BAA were busily organising, ready to view a forthcoming solar eclipse! Oh, yes! Oh, and, and then the Great War began. And as the lights went out across Europe, it was... Men to the trenches, women to the benches! As members went off to fight, the RAS established its own scientific relief committee. The RAS had always had fellows who served in the Royal Navy and Royal Engineers. For such men on active service, the RAS suspended penalties for non-payment of their subscriptions. And the Relief Committee made payments to um, astronomers, both male and female, who had lost their income because their lecture tours had been cancelled. Mary Adela Blagg, a published astronomer, devoted her time to charitable works, caring for Belgian refugee children, whilst continuing with her research. Among the men of the RAS who served in the Great War, William Davidson was appointed as an army chaplain in 1915. He served on the Western Front until 1918 and said of his experiences, There, the difficulties in the way of meteor observation were insuperable. <laughs> there was no adequate means of distinguishing between a fireball and a star shell. Davidson's position as director of the meteor section of the BAA was taken by Grace Cook and Fiametta Wilson. Fiametta Wilson was a committed astronomer who was not about to let the inconvenience of a world war interrupt her work. She had a platform built in the garden of her London house for better observations. But watching for meteors in wartime was a dangerous business. She was threatened with arrest by an overzealous special oh. constable that believed that she was signalling to zeppelins. <laughs> On another occasion, she only just narrowly escaped injury from bombshells uh, from those very same zeppelins. But nothing would crush her enthusiasm. The onset of zeppelin raids in 1915 also prompted the RAS into action. Precautions against war risks. So, the early minutes of the society were placed for their own protection in an iron safe and the most valuable books from the library and a number of paintings of sentimental value were placed for their safety in the basement. The Phoenix Insurance Company was paid a £9 extension fee as insurance against air raid damage. On a more practical note and to demonstrate their contribution to the war effort, the RAS lent optical equipment to the Army, the Navy and the War Inventions Board. And they made a £500 war loan to His Majesty's Government. Oh, and uh, at the same time they put another completely unconnected matter before His Majesty the King. The obstacle of admitting women into the RAS had always been the RAS Foundation Charter. <clears throat> to change it would require royal assent, a supplementary charter, and a fee of £100. You might think that with war raging, bombs falling on London, the prospect of an uncertain future would leave the RAS somewhat distracted. But at the annual general meeting of 1915, the council proposed that the meeting should approve of the admission of women as fellows and associates. No one spoke against the proposal and the council was asked to take the necessary steps to make their election possible. They had already made inquiries at the Privy Council offices. A draft petition and charter had been prepared. The wheels were in motion. In November 1915, the RAS 
received its supplementary charter with the following amendment to bylaw 86. In the construction of these bylaws, words donating the masculine gender only shall include the feminine gender also. January the 14th, 1916, the following female astronomers were admitted into the RAS. Mary Adela Blagg, Ella K. Church, A. Grace Cook, and Violetta Wilson. <coughs> <coughs> they were torchbearers. They were the shining stars. And like all stars, they lit the way for others. Perhaps the position of female astronomers was best summed up by Lady Margaret Huggins. I find that men welcome women scientists, provided they have the proper knowledge. When women have really taken pains thoroughly to fit themselves to assist or to do original work, scientific men are willing to treat them as equals. It is a matter of sufficient knowledge that there is any wish to throw hindrances in the way of women who wish to pursue science, I do not for a moment believe. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. I'd just like to say what a fantastic and wonderful and unique way of celebrating this important anniversary. Yeah, yeah. Please yeah. give them all a thoroughly massive round of applause again. <laughs> Well, we hope you've enjoyed our play, The Way to the Stars, and we hope that, like us, you've been inspired by the stories of these remarkable women. If you'd like to find out more about astronomy, then please contact the Royal Astronomical Society.